Hello everyone, I want to talk today about chemical reactions. So before we begin, there are a really a, an amazing number of chemical reactions that exist and you can categorize them a lot of different ways and if you continue on in chemistry you'll end up trying to work through through most of those different types of reactions and learn how to understand them and predict when they'll happen, what the products will be, etc. But we're going to get started today with just a basic set of reactions and we have two essentially systems for describing those reactions. So one I've written here on the right hand side and one over here on the left hand side. And the ones on the right hand side are sort of what we're getting at, what we'd really like to be able to figure out when we talk about this section. And they describe, I'm, I'm going to say, they sort of describe how you can, what you're going to observe as a result of these reactions. So these first three reactions are about reactions that will take place in water, or aqueous reactions, and you'll hopefully be able to observe something about them taking place. And the bottom two are also ones we want to do. You won't be able to observe them the same way, but there are some observations you should be able to make about these, and they're also just very kind of very common reactions that take place. And you're, you'll, as we talk about them, you'll actually probably recognize some of the places where we see these. And over here, we have sort of a very, very generic way of describing reactions. But it helps actually to start with these to have a general discussion about how uh, the generically reactions take place. And then that will help us describe what we might observe about a reaction. So you might be able to categorize it from something over here and something over here at the same time. So without further ado, let's dive in. And I'm going to actually work in a weird order here. I'm going to go from down here, up and around. So let's start down here with decomposition. So decomposition reaction is something falling apart. So let's take a very common compound that we're used to, sodium chloride, and we'll do examples for each of these and draw a chemical reaction for this sodium chloride decomposing or falling apart. So let's take solid sodium chloride that we're very familiar with and make it decompose into its constituent elements. It would decompose into sodium, metal, and so that would be a solid, and chlorine gas, and chlorine as we know is a diatomic element, so Cl2 gas. Now the last thing we need to do is balance the reaction to make sure they're the same elements on both sides of the equation. So we'll come over here and we'll say there are two chlorines there, so to get two chlorines over here we, we must need to be doing this reaction with two sodium chlorides. Can't change what the the compound is. Can't change its chemical formula, just change the number of them that we need. We need to put in two sodium chlorides if we're going to get out a Cl2 gas. And then because of that, that makes two sodium atoms that are involved, so two sodium atoms must as well come out of this reaction. So there you have it, the decomposition reaction of sodium chloride. You take a, an ionic compound and decompose it into its constituent elements. Now a combination reaction would be just the exact opposite of this. So we're going to just flip it around. Two solid sodium metals go in and one Cl2 gas goes in and what we get out is two sodium chlorides solid. It's that simple. Now you hear a lot of different names for these. This is probably the worst one. Some people call this synthesis some people call it composition, so you have composition and decomposition, or synthesis, combination, they all mean the same thing. Um, and you'll hear different names for everything, so just try to make, make the connection, but the name should sound relatively similar. So let's move on to the next one, single displacement. Single displacement is where you start out with a substance like copper, for example, that could be a solid. Then you mix with it a solution like silver nitrate solution, and that would be aqueous. A solution means it's dissolved, in this case an aqueous solution dissolved in water. And what you'll see happening is the copper will take the place of silver in this reaction. So we'll end up getting out solid silver metal, and we'll get copper two nitrate. Copper two nitrate. Notice that 
the number of nitrates over here in the chemical formula matches, there's one nitrate because nitrate is a one negative charge and silver is a one positive charge. But over here, copper two, copper with a two positive charge needs to bond with two nitrates because each nitrate has a negative one charge. So it doesn't need to be the same, you don't need to have two nitrates in this formula over here, or one nitrate in this formula, just write the correct formula, chemical formula for the compound. Same way that we've always done it. Same way where you, you look at the charges and you make a neutral compound out of it where the charges are equal, add up to zero, just like we've always done. And then after that, you'll deal with there being two of those by balancing it. So we'll come back over here and say if there are two nitrates there, we must need to have two silver nitrates over here. And if that happens, then there need to be two silvers over here. So when we're doing this reaction, we for every one copper atom we put in, we need to have two formula units of silver nitrate. So that that provides enough nitrate to bond with the copper. And if you can come by a silver nitrate solution, this is actually relatively easy to do. Just drop a penny in a silver nitrate solution and you'll see this reaction happen. You'll see silver forming on the surface of the penny. It'll actually kind of look black, not very shiny. And you'll see the solution actually turning a little bit bluish because copper in, in water, copper two in water is a little bit of a bluish color. So there you have it, your first single displacement reaction, copper displacing silver. So they're just swapping in which metal is bonded to the nitrate. And some people call it a single replacement reaction for the obvious reason that it's replacing silver. So moving on to the double displacement reaction, that's the same thing's going to happen but twice. So let's imagine we have Let's go back to our trusty chemical we like, sodium chloride. We use it all the time, except this time we're going to use sodium chloride dissolved in water. We're going to mix it with, let's say, a lead nitrate solution, where you have lead bonded to nitrate. This is also dissolved in water. We know it will dissolve in water because nitrate is always soluble. No matter what it's combined with, the compounds containing nitrate always dissolve in water. So in a double displacement reaction, we're going to swap the metal. So lead is going to go with chloride and sodium is going to go with nitrate. Now when you're doing this, it may be actually helpful to make a quick note down below about what the charges of the ions are that are here so that you're, you write the correct formulas of the compounds over here. So I'm going to do that for us really quick. So we have a sodium ion there that's bonded to a chloride ion. This one is made up of a lead ion bonded to two nitrate ions. So nitrates have a one negative charge and they're both bonded to the lead. So you can see from the two negative one charges on the nitrate that the lead must, to have made this neutral compound, must have a two positive charge. So there we go. Now it's quick to, or it's a good thing to pay attention to this right now. The nitrates each have a negative charge so they would not be stuck together. So we want to draw that out because it's really common error that people make. They say, well, I'm just going to swap sodium in with the nitrates. So they write something like this. And you'll get that wrong and you'll have a really hard time balancing these from here or, or getting anything correct because this is not the correct formula of sodium nitrate. Just because there were two sodiums that needed to bond, or two nitrates, I'm sorry, that needed to bond with the lead here doesn't mean the two nitrates need to bond with the sodium. They're both a one negative and one positive charge, so we just need a one to one ratio there. The two nitrates wouldn't, wouldn't be together here either because nitrates don't actually attract to each other. They're both negative, so they would repel each other. They could separately, the reason they're in the compound here is because separately they each are attracted to the two positive lead ion. So let's get rid of that that we wrote incorrectly. We're working in pencil today, so we can erase and we'll write the correct formula of sodium nitrate. One positive with one negative means they go together one to one. Then we'll write the correct formula of the next compound, which is gonna be lead with chloride. That's a two positive and chloride is only a one negative. So I need two chlorides to go with the lead. PB, and I, I'm not leaving myself enough space there, so I better erase something. PB. Cl2. Now, if you want to figure out what the states are going to be, because we should know that, 
anything with sodium or nitrate in it will always be aqueous because it dissolves in water really nicely. Lead is not really that way and chloride has some exceptions as well. Chloride likes to dissolve in water but there are some exceptions and it turns out that lead is one of those exceptions. So this one is actually going to form a solid. This one will not stay dissolved in water. It's going to if it forms in water, it's going to form a solid and float down to the bottom of the beaker. And you'll be able to see that forming. It'll look cloudy at first, and then if you wait over time, you'll see the solid floating to the bottom. So this forms a solid and an aqueous compound, and we do need to go ahead and balance that. To get two nitrates, we would put a two there, and then we have two sodiums, and we need two chlorides as well. So we'll put a two there, and we have a balanced chemical reaction. Now we can move over to these reactions and we can start to pick up the pace a little bit. All of these reactions are types of double displacement reactions. So these are reactions happening in water that do a double displacement and then we're talking about usually the product that forms as a result of that. So we'll move over here, and what you've already seen here is an example of a precipitation reaction. A precipitation reaction is a double displacement reaction that forms a solid. So a double displacement reaction that forms a solid. That solid forms in the, the aqueous mixture and floats to the bottom of the beaker, so it precipitates out. A gas evolution reaction then is a double displacement reaction that forms a gas. So you're able to see the gas bubbling out of the solution. Now there are other reactions that form a gas. There are lots of oxidation reduction reactions that form gases. But this is specifically a double displacement reaction where they swap cations to, that combine with the anions and that results in the formation of a gas. So let's do an example of one of those. These can be a little tricky, so this will probably need some extra time to figure out. So let me show you how this works though. We'll go with a classic one. We'll do sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, which is more commonly known as baking soda. And we'll dissolve that in water to begin with and we'll mix it with, we'll do vinegar. So this is the classic, the acetic acid that's in vinegar. So this is the classic reaction that you did when you were kids in the volcano. So you mix baking soda and vinegar and they form all this gas that bubbles up. So you've already been familiar with this. So we swap the partners. We take the sodium and we put it with the acetate and we take the hydrogen and put it with the hydrogen carbonate. So we get first H2CO3, carbonic acid, H2CO3, and that would be aqueous and sodium acetate and that would also be aqueous. Now the thing is, is when you get this particular compound forming in water, carbonic acid, it turns out this is unstable and it immediately decomposes, breaks down into water, H2O, so you can see the two hydrogens and one of the oxygens goes to make a water, which will be a liquid, and carbon dioxide, which will be a gas. So that's not in the reaction anymore. You have these two things going together to form water, carbon dioxide, and sodium acetate. The carbon dioxide is a gas which bubbles out of the reaction mixture. There are a number of things that can form and produce gases this way, but you'll probably have to memorize a very short list of these. Most, most classes, it's about four things that you have to memorize that, that do this and it's not too, too big of a deal. All right, next up, we'll look at acid-base neutralization reactions. So neutralization reactions are double displacement reactions that form, that form a weak acid. Usually water in particular is what we're looking for. But it's easier to spot them if you look at what goes in. And so that's why we often just call them an acid-base reaction. So you know that acids have H plus on them and bases have OH negative on them based on the Arrhenius way of looking at, at acids. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a double displacement reaction between 
an acid and a base. So that will be the easiest way to spot these, and that's why we usually end up just calling them acid-base reactions instead of neutralization reactions. So let's write a quick example of that. That would be something like hydrochloric acid, which of course is an acid, reacting with a base like sodium hydroxide, both dissolved in water. To form, sodium goes with the chloride, sodium chloride, and what do you get when you put an H plus with an OH negative? H plus and OH negative gives us H2O, and that we write as liquid. Now we don't write aqueous for water because aqueous means dissolved in water. So the idea of water being dissolved in water is a bit silly. So we just say water is the liquid that's formed. So there you go. Those are our three types of double displacement reactions that we want to look at. So it's good to recognize when you're seeing these that they start out as a double displacement type setup where there's a cation and an anion that you can swap that will give you the products. And that's the way that's easy, the easy way to predict the products for these reactions to begin with. Then of course you have to check and see if a solid is formed like in this precipitation reaction or if one of those gas evolution products is formed or if the reactants are an acid and a base. So those are the main ones we spend most of our time on in, a, in an introductory chemistry course or even in a general chemistry course. Um, but we want to go on to a couple more because these are really important. So oxidation reduction reactions are all about transfers of electrons. And we spot these by changes in, and I'm going to put this in quotes, and this you should take with a big grain of salt, changes in charge. Now I'm going to say charge at this point because we haven't talked about calculating oxidation numbers. But what we really want to look for is a change in oxidation numbers, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's just say when you can spot a change in a charge, something's going from a neutral charge to a positive one or something like that, then on a specific element, then you're probably talking about an oxidation reaction, reduction reaction. So the examples of those are actually right over here. We've seen a whole bunch of them. We saw that copper here was neutral. But now copper over here in this compound is a positive 2 charge. It's copper 2 that's bonding to the nitrates, which are negative. Or silver here was a positive 1 charge, but it became a neutral silver atom here. So this is an oxidation reduction reaction. This one here, sodium was a neutral element. Chlorine was a neutral element. Now sodium has a positive 1 charge and chlorine a negative 1 charge, where it had a 0 over here. Same thing down here, except it went the other direction from positive and negative 1 to 0 and 0. So these are all examples of standard oxidation reduction reactions. In fact, the most common ones to spot in early chemistry classes is definitely the single displacement reaction. If you're going to look for an oxidation reduction reaction, um, very, very often it's going to be a single displacement. It's really easy to spot because you can see something's neutral going in and now it's a cation in an ionic compound. So you know it must have been a zero to start with because it didn't have a charge and it must have gained some kind of a charge over here. That's the easy way to spot oxidation reduction reactions. There are many, many, many of these. Well, this is what drives our batteries. Every battery is running an oxidation reduction reaction, transferring the electrons through our device. That's how it powers our device is as it runs it from one side to the other, it transfers those electrons through the wiring of our device that powers our device. So then there's a subclass of oxidation reduction reactions that we want to talk about a little bit called combustion. This is something that you're all relatively familiar with. We can spot these because they emit a lot of light and heat and usually in what we'd call a flame. The other way is, is through glowing combustion like a coal that you would see in your barbecue. But these are combustion reactions and they're relatively easy to spot. We want to just focus on a very simple way to spot them right now. Although this is, is getting about 95% of the ones that you'll see. Technically there are others, but this is what you want to look for. It's very simple. You simply want to look for something. This could be anything at all. We're going to write methane, which is the, the main component of natural gas, reacting with oxygen gas. So this is what you want to look for. One of the reactants being O2. 
in a combustion reaction. Now there are other reactions with oxygen, but this is the, generally the very simple way to spot it. So this, is, this particular one is going to form carbon dioxide and water. I'm sorry. And then we would need to balance this, so we'd go ahead and balance the chemical reaction like that. Lots of things can combust. Things like magnesium combust really, really well. You can put in solid magnesium and burn it in air. When you burn things in air, you're burning them, you're combining them with the oxygen in air specifically to get the solid magnesium oxide compound and, um, well actually I'm sorry, that's it and nothing. Solid magnesium oxide compound, then I'll need to balance it to get the reaction ratio correct. So that's it, this would also be a combustion reaction. This is how metals combust. So that's pretty much it. That gives you a, a really basic primer on how to understand chemical reactions. You'd see that many of these would fall into multiple categories here. And that's a good thing. Being able to understand them both ways is a more thorough understanding of, of what's actually happening in the reaction. Notice that just because there are gases being put out here in a, in a combustion reaction doesn't mean it's a gas evolution reaction. It's a combustion reaction. Gas evolution reactions are specifically double displacement reactions that then form a gas bubbling out of the solution. So have, understanding both ideas is really crucial in not getting them mixed up. That's it. Thank you for bearing with me for this long discussion and happy studying.